By working the Club of Rome together with WWF and in particular our partner in crime, Potsdam Institute and the incredible work of Johan Rockström and Owen Gaffney, we decided that it was absolutely imperative that as we were talking about climate emergency and biodiversity emergency separately, we needed to join them in a planetary emergency plan and also bring to the attention and the consciousness of governments across the globe the importance of putting in place not only planetary emergency declarations, but also key commitments and actions over the course of this decade. What happened last year was quite phenomenal. Before we even came to COVID, we had a leaders gathering during the UN General Assembly in September where many governments subscribed completely to the planetary emergency language and narrative, but also to this call for action. Since then, we have 1,700 jurisdictions from across the globe, 30 countries who have bought into the fact that we are in clearly a planetary emergency. And then we were hit by COVID. Clearly, the messages that we already had in the planetary emergency plan and the narrative around this convergence of these tipping points is very much linked to the zoonic disease that is COVID. And as we've gone through now this COVID crisis and are still in the crisis in many countries, it made us realize the importance of thinking about the convergence, not only of biodiversity and climate, but also clearly health. Over the course of the last year, as we've been going through these crises, we've brought together a partnership of over 220 organizations, ministers, NGOs, scientists, economists, who all believe that we are in the midst of a planetary emergency and now even more so must both declare that we're in emergency but prepare so that we can design our way out of the emergency to, that we can actually emerge. The emergence from emergency language is what we would like to focus on today. Many of you have received a link to our newest version of the planetary emergency plan this is a draft for consultation. We're launching it today at London Climate Action Week. Although none of us can be there physically, this marks the one year anniversary of when we actually launched the previous version of the Planetary Emergency Plan and we met at Chatham House in early July last year. What do we want to do today? We want to make sure that the broadest group of stakeholders come together and have a concrete discussion, not only about what does emergency mean now within this convergence of three crises, but also how can we actually emerge from emergency? What are the solutions? How can we optimize our collaboration, bring in non-state actors and state actors, and ensure that not only the planetary emergency partners, but more partners across the globe join us in order to make this truly a decade of action that hits our health concerns, our nature concerns, and our climate concerns. So this afternoon, we will have a series of sessions that would look at people, planet, and prosperity, addressing the health issues very specifically, but also addressing the nature-based solutions, nature capital issues, and then looking also clearly at the climate, natural and human value dimension of finance as we close the day and then hopefully all come together for a drink to celebrate life all of us who are here who are doing well to think about those who have lost their lives and livelihoods during this very big and difficult period and also to prepare for those crises that we know will be before us but that together we can confront. We have an unbelievable panel of people who are dedicating their time and energy to different aspects of the planetary emergency. But I would like to first turn to Johan Rockström, director of the Potsdam Institute, who has been my partner in crime in developing the planetary emergency plan and reaching out with the partners to the G20 countries, 
to the European discussions through the recovery work that we've been doing, and also across the globe through the High Ambition Coalition on Climate, the High Ambition Coalition on Nature and People, and also through a series of other activities that we've undertaken on the ground. So Johan, I'll pass the video to you. Thank, thanks, Sandrine, and hello, everyone. And uh, I'd like to just um, complement this, this brilliant overview you gave, Sandrine, to uh, just remind ourselves that we, we meet digitally in the midst of the super year 2020 that never became the super year, and we have pushed it forward to 2021, the year when we know scientifically that we have to bend all the curves of exponential rise of human pressures on the planet, and that we only have 10 years of a, of a window to really start transforming for equity, prosperity on a stable and resilient Earth system. And as a scientist, I really want to you know, kick this off by, by honestly sharing with you that declaring a state of planetary emergency does not come lightly. In fact, when you think of it, it can only be done once in the existence of humanity on Earth. Because either you've never run into that challenge, or you do run into it as we have done, and you resolve it. And if you don't resolve it, you don't want to think of the outcome. So we actually, before we even met and designed the first planet emergency plan, we went through a broad synthesis of the science, recognizing that risk is equal to time, limited time, multiplied by the probability multiplied by the impact. And when you look at the evidence today, it's not only that we've come to an uncomfortably high probability of irreversible, potentially catastrophic risks with tipping points across the whole planet, but also in terms of the impacts of extreme events and undermining our ability to potentially deliver on sustainable development goals, but particularly we're running out of time. And when you combine this together, we came to the conclusion that there is no other uh, honest, objective, evidence-based conclusion than to declare a state of planetary emergency. Before this was done, over 100 countries had actually declared a climate emergency. But we have a systemic risk of people health and planetary health. So just to provide you with, with a firm evidence that we're not taking this lightly and that we are taking this as the entry point, for the emergence and transformation towards an equitable and prosperous future. And just to close this off, to say that just as, as Sandrine points out, that these are interconnected crises, that the corona crisis is a manifestation of this broad emergency point. We have all the evidence that the zoonotic virus spillover, and Andy Haynes is here and can share that much more as an expert from global public health, is undermining natural ecosystems, leading to virus spillovers to wildlife over domestic animals many times to humans is the most likely explanation of what we are facing right now. But I really want to emphasize one further point, which are the teleconnections, that as the corona crisis hits hardest on the most vulnerable communities in the world, which happen to be generally those communities that depend mostly on functioning ecosystems, leading to situations of food insecurity, health insecurity, hit by extreme events such as the droughts in East Africa and the locust, the desert locust invasions, that creates pots of cocktails of instability, which is exactly the kind of situation of health crisis, ecological crisis, climate crisis, acting right as we speak, getting outcomes of social instability, which is the driving force why we need to act so fast. So we have all the evidence we need, and clearly we have many hands on deck, which is not least represented in this dialogue. So it's an incredibly important moment in time to have this conversation. Back to you, Sandrine. Thank you so much, Jan. And, and I think that what's interesting in what you say as well, and especially what COVID has shown us, is that the, not only the hard sciences, but now the social sciences, and the way in which we can bring different parts of our multidisciplinary academics together to think through this convergence of these three very important crises. It's only the beginning 
And the more we're able, and that is why we've, we've tried within the Planetary Emergency Partnership to bring in different partners representing those different disciplines. So I'm very pleased as we move into the panel discussion to be able to bring out some of those voices and some of the different aspects that will enable us to really understand how we can build greater resilience and tap into the open consciousness of many people coming out of COVID around their understanding of what's essential because that will also shift the way in which we're able to work together with governments, with different industries, and with different citizens on the ground. So I want to first introduce another partner in crime, Bernadette Fischler, who is the head of international advocacy for the World Wildlife Fund, who was very much part of the intimate first group who created the Planetary Emergency Plan. And Bernadette, can you give us a bit of your impression of where we've come from since you were there at the beginning, and also some of the questions that we're asking around what do we need now in our new planetary emergency plan? How do we flesh that out properly to represent the key crises we're looking at? Sure, and many thanks, Sandrina. Hello, everybody. Um, if you have ever heard me talking in the last two or even three years, you have certainly heard me talking about the 2020 super year. Um, and how we need this integrated approach to nature, climate and people that is also at the heart of all the considerations in the planetary emergency thinking. And um, I don't know, uh, I, I presume it's worth um, commemorating the 2020 super year for a second, but then also uh, focusing back on the fact that it was probably great while it lasted, but it's not over yet. It might, it has just moved a little bit. Um, and I'm very glad that I have been part of this journey over the last year um, and that to see that this like little gang that we formed at the beginning has turned in such a rich and vibrant partnership that has come together. And yeah, looking back over the year, it was quite a year, hasn't it been? Um, for me, what comes to mind uh, on reflection is um, that everything has changed, but nothing has changed. Um, and that's also why it is so important to continue working with Planetary Emergency Plan. It's more relevant than ever before, because we still need the political momentum. We still need this integrated approach. We still need this, this super year, even if it's not taking place in 2020. Um, and there's, there's now more than ever a great need to uh, continue working on it. Like if you look at the current context, you could say everything has changed. Lots of people have died. The, the Everybody has changed something about the way they live. Um, some governments have raised to the challenge and some have abysmally locked down their people. And there's a lot of rhetoric going on at the moment about green recovery, but yet we have to see whether it's really going to happen. Lots of money has been put into healthcare, but uh, not enough and other money is needed. And um, also, but even in this context, actually, what I find is really important to note is that uh, surveys show that in the UK alone, two thirds of people believe that climate change is still a really serious issue next to the coronavirus. And that the majority really wants that uh, climate is prioritized in the kind of recovery. Other surveys have shown that the biggest part of society really doesn't want to go back to business as usual. And that really gives hope. That gives hope that a different way is possible and then we can emerge from this emergency, which is a phrase that I really, really enjoyed that Sandrine um, coined about a year ago. But at the same time, if we look at the problems we face, not much has changed or nothing has changed. We still need to hold the loss of biodiversity. We still need to address climate change. We cannot just press pause on these crises and say, can you please wait until we've sorted out our economy over here. Um, we still need to protect our planet and by that protect our people. And uh, only looking forward, we'd have to still do all the same things we knew we need to do a year ago, only now on the backdrop of famine and mass unemployment and civil unrest and everything else. Um, so our determination just needs to be a lot stronger. And I'm really, really glad to be part of this um, partnership because if I look around me, I see a lot of determined faces and I see a lot of eminent experts. And the one thing that has changed recently is that 
science is sexy again. And that gives me a lot of hope. So people believe in evidence again, people listen to experts and that's exactly the role that the planetary emergency plan has to play. It is the voice, the combined voice of experts that gives hope, that shows a different way. And that is a determined way forward <laughs> to, uh, to um, bring about this super year whenever it's going to happen, but very soon. I think there's no time to lose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernadette. I like, I like several things you've said. Everything has changed, but nothing has changed. Science is sexy again. I think that for scientists, that's definitely the coined phrase that's going to come out of this. But I think you couldn't be more accurate in your assessment of the need to bring in different voices and to ensure that actually things do change post-COVID. Um, and that we have as broad-based a foundation of experts to ensure that that happens. And that's why I'm, I'm really pleased to bring in Andy Haynes, who joined the Planetary Emergency Partnership very soon after we launched it, who already prior to COVID has been talking about health, and the issues of hygiene and tropical medicine, but also the impact of climate change and biodiversity on people's health through pollution and impacts coming directly from our relationship with the planetary emergency, with the planetary boundaries. So Andy, um, what, what is your thinking and reflection also with regard to the planetary emergency plan? What, what do we need to do next? And how can we also better enhance our collaboration with those in the health community? Well, thanks so much, uh, Sandrine, for the introduction. And it's a great pleasure for me to say a few words now. I mean, this uh, planetary emergency plan resonates very strongly with me as a health professional, because it's very clear that the environmental crisis is also a health crisis, and we're living that through that right now. Um, a few years ago, I had the honor of chairing the Rockefeller Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, and we made the case that the trends that we're seeing in the environment are going to undermine the progress that we've seen over recent decades in human health. And sadly, that now appears to be happening. So there are a number of mechanisms by which environmental change can affect human health. There's the direct effects, for example, of climate change, increasing heat and so on, increasing death rates from heat, inability to work because of extreme heat. There's the effects through ecosystems due to climate and other environmental changes, and Johan's already referred to some of those. And that will lead to an increased risk of zoonotic diseases, diseases transmitted from animals, as we're seeing at the moment. And these changes include land use change, wildlife trade, intensive livestock rearing, and so on. And then there's the effects that are mediated through social and economic systems. So increasing poverty, or people forced back into poverty, migration, population displacement, and perhaps increased conflict as well. So through all these pathways then, these environmental changes are increasingly going to affect human health adversely. And that's why it's very important that we not only adapt to these changes, as we have to adapt to some of them, but we also think about ways in which we can rapidly transform our economy into an economy which supports human health within planetary boundaries. So that means rapid decarbonization, rapid reduction of our environmental footprint, but always with an eye to sustaining and improving health. So as we emerge from COVID, we need to do so by enhancing equity, by increasing social support systems, by funding universal health coverage, uh, which is a, clearly uh, an absolute uh, necessity. But we know that health systems, health care systems by themselves are not sufficient. And we've seen some of the countries which have very strong health care systems actually doing rather poorly in COVID, including my own. We can maybe come back to the reasons for that in discussion if people are interested. But what it emphasizes to us is that we need to address the environmental and social determinants of health. And we need to look for positive solutions. So moving forward, it's not sufficient just to declare an emergency. That can actually make people frightened. It can disconnect them. Uh, they retreat back into uh, their own uh, personal world. And what's really important is to motivate people with a vision of the kind of society that we all want to live in. And that society would have health at the center, environmental sustainability at the center, uh, but also equitable um, economic recovery. And so we need to aim for solutions that some people call triple win solutions, good for health, good for the environment, good for equity. So for example, if we take out the fossil fuel subsidies, we currently are subsidizing our own destruction, which is an extraordinary uh, thing to be doing, 400 billion a year at least. 
Um, we need to divert those subsidies into renewable energy, into universal health coverage, and a whole host of other more sustainable strategies. But in doing so, we can get near-term benefits. So if we cut out the air pollution that we generate when we burn fossil fuels, that will save probably over 3 million premature deaths a year, something of that order. So I'll stop by just saying we need a positive vision. I think we can build on that. We need to optimize our collaboration by working with professional groups, by bringing in more people from the global south and uh, youth as well. So I'm delighted to see that the next speaker is going to represent youth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andy. And, and I think what you also didn't really mention, but it is true and is the, the debate that we are all faced with, which is the complexity of all of this, right? And the interrelationships between people, planet and prosperity. We, we look at the dilemma between the Gilets Jaunes and the youth that have gone to the streets calling for the issues around the end of the world. Um, and, and how do we actually bring those together? And, and the next two speakers for me can speak to that. One is Father Augusto Zampini, who he and I have been crossing each other over the last few years on these very important issues. And I'm so pleased to see you, Father Zampini, also so involved now on the COVID commission for the Pope himself, as well as your incredible work that you've always done on, on the social and environmental dimension of, of how we can actually bring these issues to bear to people and also through the faith community. I would love to get your impression of our planetary emergency plan. And there is a question which we will get to in a moment, but science is sexy. And if science is sexy, how can we bring this to the people? How can we get out of the fake facts and, and the hate that some are in particular in leadership positions, pushing back to the science and the cooperation and the collaboration and the love for each other and for the planet that we hold so dear. Thank you, Sandrine, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, yes, what, what, what I would like to point out, perhaps three points in that regard, uh, to, um, when we see a, a critical em emergency, as you, as you call it, for the planet, we also see a critical emergency for people. And this is what the Pope calls integral ecology. No? He, he mentioned that five years ago. So you can, we cannot address ecological issues, such as biodiversity, destruction, climate change, planet social issues, because we human beings are, we can destroy it. You know? uh, so. Uh, we're having difficulty hearing you, Augusto. Is everyone else having difficulty as well? Yes? Maybe if you could turn off your video. It might help. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. So, um, so what we are saying that equally we cannot address the social issues without addressing the ecological ones. No? Yes. Um, but uh, because people need to work, and some this is was the mistake of the seventies, no, the environmental that we forgot that we are we we cannot change what we need to change without people. Now. Oh, we've lost you again. As you, as you mentioned before, and Johan mentioned before, it's critical because uh, it's urgent. If we don't do it now, we, are, we will address those tipping points and, and uh, irreversible damage. But also it's new. Why is it? Because it's complex and it's new. And now we have COVID inside. So we cannot address as uh, Professor Heinz was, was mentioning, without new thinking. No? We cannot make the mistake that uh, Albert Einstein was saying. No? This is a, new, a complex and quite relatively new because everything is connected. Okay, we've lost you again. Uh, now? There you are. So this is the firewalls of the Vatican, sorry. 
uh, but uh, but so we can say we cannot uh, how can we address this complexity with yeah with the sexy science with imagination with the plurality that was mentioned before uh, but also with the spirit no yes we have a time frame of a seven year conversion uh, time no because we all need to convert ourselves the way we eat the way we buy the way we consume the way we take holidays the way we invest in our savings if we have any the way we work the schools the universities so how can we create a seven or decade commitment plans more than statements why i'm saying this people won't change we learn this from from the, from the scientists no People won't change because scientists tell me. People won't change because even a priest tells me. People won't change because the Club of Rome will issue a statement. People will change if they link what's happening with their own deep values. And in deep values, this is the, the missing point, there is the spirit, spirituality, broadly speaking. Now, this was the mistake of the 80s and the 90s of all the international development agencies that they put aside the spirituality, the religious, 80% of the population in the world they claim to be religious, to believe in something. So how can we help with that? This is the driver of change. You, you, you point out in your, in your marvelous uh, proposal, the actions for transformation. But we are, what we are asking is what, where is the motivation for transformation going to come from? Again, it will come from the heart. So more than actions, it will come from the attitudes Okay, we've lost you again. Mm -hmm. There you are. So we have to so come have, from the heart and come from the attitude. Yes, and I have an example. And, and, and if that happens, that allows a systemic change. The example is COVID. One of the mo most important things we learned from COVID is that countries were able to lock down, to shut down their countries at the expense of the economy, of people's work. Why? Because people, and, and they couldn't have done that without people's support. Why? Because people were linking that with their own health, with their own life. So one thing that we... This is really a shame because you're... Sorry, sorry. I'm it's sorry, okay. sorry. It's okay, it's okay, don't worry. So, with, with, so can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. So I was saying briefly that people people are concerned about their health, their food, and their values. If we if we missed that, we won't be able to take the participation and agency that is required to help politicians and economists and scientists to promote the systemic change that is needed. And I will end up because given that my, my connection is not good with a note of, because um, Bernadette mentioned a hope. But hope, I agree with the movements of young people. Well, where is hope? I mean, they're questioning hope. I cannot question hope because I'm, I'm a person of faith. But look at the word emergency, the etymology of the emergency. The etymology of emergency comes from arise, from bring something to light. So it's not just a catastrophe. So what we are proposing to you, to this proposal, is not to address the planetary emergency as, as a catastrophe or apocalyptic message. But something can arise, can bring up to light with all the people, with the faith, with the values, with economic sciences, people of faith, that we are not going to wait for the UN or for somebody to tell us what to do. We are going to do it anyway, as the young people are doing it. But we want to do it with all the people that we can. And this is what the Pope is asking us. He says, prepare the future, not prepare for the future. Prepare for the future is our destiny is set. Fine, we, we start buying save uh, save life jackets no prepare the future is this is the future that we want and this is what we are going to do to get to the future this is the people that we need so and that's a new emergency something new emerging but it's not a catastrophic thing it's a new movement of people who are going to change the world or who are going to transform this planet for the good of not just of nature but also for the good of the of people particularly for those of the poor thank you Thank you so much for your beautiful thoughts. And I know how frustrating it is to get cut off continuously <laughs> due to bandwidth issues. But I think you were able to convey exactly what many of us believe in the Planetary Emergency Partnership. 
and in particular through the Club of Rome's work, which builds on what Bernadette and yourself are saying, which is, we have always felt that you can emerge from emergency. You need to build that resilience. Building that resilience means you need to bring more people to understand that actually this does touch their lives. The beauty of the Planetary Emergency Partnership and the work that we've been able to do together is that each individual is fundamentally touched by the crisis but, and the crises but fully understands that we can only get through them by having hope and believing that we actually have the solutions at hand. And I think that is very important in particular as we move towards Marie Claire. Because Marie Claire, many people have mentioned the youth and the hope. And although many of us feel that even though we're older, we've been trying to bring forward that hope and that sense of vision and actually that together we can make a difference, it is clear that the youth movements over the last years, last two years in particular, in the climate space have really shifted some of the discussion. So I don't know how you perceive the work that we've been doing at the Planetary Emergency Partnership and through the work that Johan, myself and others have been doing as a, as a young person trying to understand how best to influence decision makers. Absolutely. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation, for this call and for the plan. I was exactly one year ago, it was also in London um, at the point and since then um, following the activities and try to uh, yeah, also support from a youth perspective. I will quickly share some slides um, as I think it's very important um, to, to have some visuals. Uh, young people work a lot with visuals. I think the goal is, is very clear, right? Um, save our earth. Um, and so we don't have to talk about, about this anymore. So we assessed all the problems and we also have a clear vision where we want to go. Um, and also we have a plan to basically get there. As you have been mentioning, um, young people, especially in the recent years, but also uh, to highlight a lot of other people in broader society, have been taking unprecedented, bold, impactful, positive, meaningful, but also risky and ambitious actions for the climate and to achieve the SDGs in, in general. So what I think is the, the only point which is missing um, is, is to raise broader awareness, but also the capacity the capacity to imagine this transformation in a positive way, as we have already been talking about. And with this taking the actions required, and with this feeling part of it, so taking ownership of being part of this transformation, being part of this better and this more sustainable climate-friendly normal. And for this, um, Father Augusta, you already mentioned, um, coming from the brain to our hearts. Because I really do believe that many young people are so passionate in our hearts and that's why we are spending so much time and energy and passion about this topic. So how can we bring this, all these topics and especially transformation um, into our hearts, into our emotions? And I think this I is- I'm just gonna interrupt you for one minute. I just need to make sure that everyone else can see your slides, not just us, because these slides are brilliant. So Laura, can you tell us if the rest, is, I have a message from those that are outside of the panelists and it seems, yes, we can see your slides. Perfect. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, so I think that the, what, is, what is missing um, is now is really bringing this, this ownership to the people. And I think for this, um, it's very important that we are all human beings. And I think what is sometimes also like for me personally, um, putting a barrier that some people are hiding be behind titles and processes and decisions um, and are not true human beings. Because if we would all act as human beings, I don't think we would be where we are at the moment. Um, this has a lot to do with like really being a human being and acting from, from a personal, um, emotional, emotional state. And I think for this, there are probably five, at least, at least for me, there are probably like five things um, which can be helpful uh, for for also making this happen in, in terms of this planet emergency, um, planetary emergency plan. So I think it's having clarity, clarity about this transformation. I think it's very good outline, but now it's about the communication and putting, as already mentioned, this emotional part to it, um, but also um, increasing the commitment. And I here think it's very important to talk about intergenerational actions. There have been, as you mentioned, people like they're spending their entire life on what we are doing now. And I think it's so important to learn from um, all the expertise 
right, the, the limits to growth and so on, like learning from what has been going on in the past, but also without judgment, seeing um, what young people are doing and combine all these efforts together. So having an, yeah, a very, very strong commitment. Also, when we talk about competences, yes, as we were mentioning, it's, it's, it's amazing, like the IPC reports and all the science, but as well there, there are other competences we have to strengthen, especially in education. I think it's very important that we have a critical thinking, that we have an empowering of people, that we feel empowered enough to take action, because very unfortunate, a lot of young people are telling me, I'm not going to vote, I'm not taking action because I don't feel empowered enough. And I think when we talk about com com competences, it's about the hard facts, but it's also about all the soft competences, and they are really, really crucial, um, yeah, building up resilience for, for, this, for this transformation. But also it's a lot about being courageous um, and unfortunately I think this is something a lot of leaders um, are missing in today's world. Being courageous and standing up for their own values um, and speaking from a deep um, place of love, of dedication and um, also being emotional and I think we really have to get back on this and I think Club of Rome um, has been showing an yeah, amazing leadership on this, but we have to make it spread and that other people also have this, have this uh, courageous um, yeah, approach. And the last thing is, is really having a community and the young people around the world are, are here to support um, and being in this intergenerational action dialogue. Um, so really growing this community of people who want to bring along this change. Um, and for this, um, I think they're, yeah, trying to influence decision-making, high-level decision-making as we're already doing, um, interfering in financial structures, which are still working against us, and yeah, changing institution, inst institutions um, or educational institutions, and yeah, learning this transformative way of, of, of action. Yeah, and with this, over to you, Sandrine. Thank you so much, Mike, Claire, and, and I think that um, everything you said was so heartfelt. And it was the same with what Father Zampini said and everyone else before you. And that's what brings us together, right? It's, it's that, that, again, the, the human basic need to really bring forward some level of, of love and exchange that actually could make a difference. I think you bring up two really important points as we open up into the conversation with participants. One is that this crisis, and Father Zampini brought it up as well, has opened up enough consciousness to make us realize that we are all the same. We have all gone through this crisis, clearly some much more vulnerable than ourselves, but the fact is a pandemic kills. And it kills indiscriminately, apart from your own health structure and clearly some who are more vulnerable so those that are most vulnerable in society will be the greatest at risk, but it will still be a risk for those who so-called think that they are never at risk. And I think that's an important point. And what we've tried to say through the Club of Rome and what I've been bringing up time and time again is we need to move from ego systems into ecosystems. Every single slide that you brought up was around how we create that ecosystem. And that's what the Planetary Emergency Partnership is all about as well recognizing that we can only be as strong as our weakest link and that we can only address complexity if we have diversity of opinions and diversity of knowledge. And so I'd like to now open it up for questions or remarks. I saw that we have, I think, six questions in the Q&A and we can, of course, roll in some of those questions into the next discussion group, which will also be very vibrant with our speakers. I want to introduce a very important part of the Planetary Emergency Partnership, which is Elise Buckle. <laughs> Elise will be moderating this conversation. She's really been helping us build the Planetary Emergency Partnership as we've moved along throughout the year and has been facilitating our discussion. So I think it's very important that Elise be here as well. Thank you so much, Sandrine. And it's been a great honor to serve the Planetary Emergency Partnership and all of you. And it's wonderful to see so many of you online now. I think more than 120 people joining this very unique space. And so the movement is growing. And I do believe that it will keep growing because, as you said, we are all serving the same planet. We are all working for the same goal. So there is a question here. I believe it's for Johan Rockström. This is coming from Ali Banham. 
Do you feel that the voice of science in relation to climate change has been largely ignored in the last 25 years, but due to COVID-19, it might be that people and politicians are now more ready to listen? So, Johan, over to you for this first question. Yeah, thanks. This is a very important question, and it kind of requires answering in two parts. The first part, has, has science been ignored over the past 20 years? I would argue it has not. Uh, of course, uh, as a scientist, and I think we share that in this community, in this conversation today, we would have wished that society listened more to science over the past 20 years. But at the same time, one, one should recognize the, the, the progress we've made. I mean, um, we talked about the IPCC, we have the whole IPBS process on biodiversity. These are science-informed initiatives. They would never have existed if it hadn't been actually for the really important global environmental change research program that were born in the 1970s, actually. The World Climate Research Program uh, is born in, in early 1970s. So the frustration is really that academics have not been very good at communicating in ways that really reach the heart and the brain of citizens around the world. That's one part. And secondly, that we have had this tendency of, of all, um, you know, stupidly, that we can compromise with the planet, that we can negotiate with the planet, not recognizing that this is a finite, biophysically driven entity, living entity that we have to live in harmony with. So I think that that's more my issue. Now, COVID-19, will that trigger a more sexy, receptive uh, renaissance for science? I don't think so, actually. I, th I think there is a, there's a, there's a positive uh, development in the sense that uh, societies recognize that hard data, facts are really important. Scientists play a constructive role in contributing towards the betterment of societies in the world. But I still think it's a kind of an incremental way. What I'm excited about, to close, is what we're doing today, which is holding hands together, scientists, youth, business leaders, policymakers, civil society activists. I mean, that I think is the power, the power of holding hands together. And I think that is what perhaps scientists have not been all that good at sitting in our ivory towers in the past, but, uh, but we're learning. Thank you so much for this answer. So Sandrine, there's also a question for you and the Club of Rome. How do you address the complexity of system change, especially in a time when the level of complexity is increasing because the world is changing so quickly? I think it's a fantastic question. And actually the question also thought, well, didn't we all know that complexity existed already 50 years ago? And of course we did. The limits to growth is all about complex models. What's really interesting is that that model that was actually part of that environmental movement that Johan has actually just described in the 1970s was, was planted into a very old computer system that was able to churn out most of the actual outcomes that we see today. So whether it be parts per million of carbon and CO2 in our atmosphere, or whether it be impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems, pretty much all of it was already predicted in the 1970s. So exactly that issue of complexity, not only in terms of the planetary boundaries, but also the complexity of human behavior is what we need to think about. Because as Johan says, the science has been there. The science is actually getting more unequivocal. It's demonstrating all of these imbalances that we're seeing in our world. But what has still left us totally open to is behavioral change. Why is it that we have certain leaders that continue to propagate hate that actually go beyond any of our legal frameworks, whether it be for environmental reasons or human reasons, and are still in office. How is it that we see that with the COVID crisis, there are some leaders that have immediately locked down, communicated with their people, many of which actually are women who actually put in place well-being indicators prior to COVID and are now coming out much more resilient, and yet others that are continuing to propagate a GDP, a very um, 
growth and profit oriented model within their economics are going back to business as usual post COVID and haven't learned at all from what we've just gone through in the last three months and many countries are still going through. And I think that is what we need to somehow capture. And it comes back to Marie Claire's point around how can we better create communities of understanding? How can we bring this back to people, to their lives, to their livelihoods? Not only the science, but exactly as Father Zampini said, and we're trying to work at it at the Club of Rome, shifting the theory into impact, shifting the thought leadership into communities, looking at warm databases, looking at new modeling that can actually enable us to better understand how we can get this done in this decade of action. Thank you, Sandrine. So inspiring. So there's another question, I believe that would be for Bernadette, uh, which is talking about the diversity of solutions. So we're all going in the same direction, but we also have a great diversity of values, of lifestyles, of diets, of solutions. How would you address this question, and Bernadette? Over to you. Thank you. Well, um, I think there's also two parts to this question. So one is um, what to do with the fact that there is a diverse uh, views on solutions. So some people um, think vegan is the way to go. Others are uh, very sure that that's the last thing they would ever do. Um, and how to bring people together around that. And um, I think for this, uh, the, the most important thing is to take the politics out of it. Um, we've seen in recent years more and more that everything that has a diversification of views or has been turned into a culture war. And most recently we saw in the US that even COVID has, has gone exactly that way. And that is extremely unhelpful. So politicizing issues like climate change is another one like that. Um, politicizing these issues is, is the best way to bring not only diversification but also division and that is a dangerous route and we need to end that as soon as we can and the only way to do that is to find common ground often you find common ground in the values that you share and build on that um, talking to each other <laughs> surprise surprise is a good way to go so the citizens assemblies that we've seen in the uk and france and other places that are really good first attempt um, and at the end of the day it's like like johan says you have to come together and join hands you also have to trust science <laughs> which way to go um, and it's quite easy because we have great leaders that show us that it's important to trust science now that to see the pope trust science very clearly so why wouldn't we um, so that's the one thing how to bring this the diverse is um, diverse views together um, i think the second part of this answer would be that the my favorite way to go and i think that's actually something that is shared by the planetary emergency partnership generally is an integrated way so you need integrated solutions you have to find solutions that either bring you that triple win uh, across climate, nature and development, or that at least manage, help you manage the trade-offs that you would get if you don't have an integrated solution. So sometimes you can't get a win-win-win solution, but then at least you shouldn't get a lose-lose-lose solution either. Um, and that's the important thing to do. And uh, What's very, what's quite um, prominent recently is, for example, the discussion around nature-based solutions. So, um, using nature to address other issues and the role that nature plays, promoting the role that nature plays for the well-being of people, for health, for uh, climate mitigation and adaptation, and many other um, challenges that our societies face. So that is this one way, one solution. And I would put square in the center, not only because I'm from Tartaria, because I truly believe it, that nature should be at the center of everything we do when we find solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Deep listening and aiming for the common good. So there's another question for both Marie Claire and Augusto from Tree CO2, uh, who have been doing some amazing work in Canada for reforestation. How can you bring together the youth work and the work of the Vatican to mobilize for tree planting? So maybe first Marie-Claire and then Augusto. 
Well, it's a, it's a challenging question um, because like where I live in, in Switzerland, but also Western Europe, unfortunately not that many young people um, are feeling that close to, to religion. Well, I actually think they, they feel it, but they may be not showing it. And I think there it will probably be, uh, yeah, actually a good, it could be a very good um, um, program to say that, yeah, we have a common goal, um, saving our earth. And then with this maybe also find um, a way, maybe how to how to talk and having these this dialogues, as I've been mentioning, these intergenerational dialogues, obviously also goes for different um, generations, also people who live in different different places. And I, I I think that yeah, having this overarching goal and this this transformation where we all have to go anyway together um, can also bring um, yeah bring different different people together. And I do think that uh, young people would be very open. I personally have been writing um, a lot actually for the for um, some religious uh, newspapers here in Switzerland um, on yeah on, on like how we have to bring this 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 uh, vision into our hearts and have to act upon like deeper values which are also reflected in spirituality and, and religion. Thank you. Augusto? Thank you. Um, the majority of the young population in the world is in the global south and the global south the great majority of people uh, is religion, is religious. Um, but um, but concretely speaking, the, the Vatican is just kind of the office of the Pope or the seat of the Pope. But the church globally, we are a universal church. Uh, we are working a lot with young people on reforestation. Uh, for example, in the, in the Sahel, we just launched a massive uh, reforestation with different communities in India, in South America. Well, the young people in South America, they are, they are I mean, they're risking their lives in the Amazon. No, but fighting against deforestation more than forest for forestation, but the, but we I mean without the young people we without their strength without their imagination without the movements we 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 wouldn't have done many of the things that we are already doing. Uh, but certainly there there's always uh, more room for improvement. But the church is working a lot with many religious and non-religious organizations in terms of um, of de of forestation of investments, of impact investing, or um, COVID, or you name it, no? It's not, this, this is what the Pope has said in Laudato Si that yeah, it was mentioned before, no? So how can we work together to create a movement that really works for the common good? And we have something to contribute, the church, but we want also every single, the Pope says, every single source of wisdom, those wisdom of wisdom has to be heard. We cannot leave, leave out not just people, but source of wisdom. For example, indigenous communities are very important in this regard. And young people in the indigenous community are also very important, as the elders. So we are doing some things, but we want to include in not just the youth, but every single source of wisdom. The youth have a lot of things to contribute, uh, um, but, uh, but remember also that not everything is located in the developed world. Now, this is very important. The, we we are basically, basically the cause of the planetary emergency, <laughs> but the ones who suffer the cause are actually, and, and sadly and paradoxically, the one who has contributed the least. And they, but they have a lot of things to contribute to the solutions. So we are listening. We are listening to to those uh, movements as well. And I'm sure, Marie Clary, they are connected with people in the south. So it's not it's not something against young people in Switzerland, but. But the, the, the strength of the young people today in Europe is that they are connected globally. Is it not, is it not true, Marie Claire? <laughs> so this is also the strength of the, what the church is trying to do and to include all voices, uh, but also deforestation and to, to prevent deforestation, uh, but also other things, lifestyles, because the bottom line, what we, are going, what we want to question is our own lifestyles, because otherwise we will are part of the problem and not part of the solution. Thank you so much. We're going to close very soon and there are quite a few questions. I'm, I'm trying to put them together and ask the panelists if you have any closing words. It's, these questions are around the issue of how do we turn science into policy and action? We know what the solutions are, we know what is at stake, but change is still very slow on the ground. And now, especially in the post-COVID-19 recovery, 
how do we make sure the finance is going to the right place? So anyone who wants to, uh, to answer this closing question? Johan, maybe? Happy to Elise, if or you want me to start. Yeah, sure. I, I think it's an excellent closing question. And, and I think that actually we have most of the signs that we need to indicate to us that we are in an emergency. We also have most of the technological solutions that we need to indicate to us that we can emerge. What we need now is not more science. We may need more technological solutions and in particular optimization of integrated approaches exactly as Bernadette was focusing on. The integrated approaches across systems, understanding these complexities and ensuring that we really do live within the limits of the planetary boundaries. I think the most important point that was not brought up, and actually it was probably my fault, being the president of the Club of Rome, I should have brought it up from the beginning, is we have to remember that the limits to growth is not about continuing with the same systems models that we had before. We have to totally rethink our consumption patterns. It's not about tweaking the system. It's about major transformation. And I'll close with the fact that through COVID, we were forced, exactly as was said, to transform our lives. We could no longer go outside when we wanted to. We could no longer really be ourselves. We have to wear masks. We have to do social distancing, etc. If we're able to transform during these last three months in the same way as we move forward during this decade, the impact will be fundamental in terms of our planetary boundaries. So I think we can do it. We have everything we need to do it. It's a question of will and leadership and ensuring that we optimize all of our efforts to be more strategic and targeted towards the priorities that we have to hit now. Thank you so much, Sandrine. Any closing word also from Andy on science well, just and to say, Well, just to say that I think in emerging from COVID, we have to emphasize the multiple benefits of, moving, of uh, emerging from COVID on a much more sustainable trajectory. So there are, there are the near-term benefits to health that can accrue from these more sustainable investment pathways, but also the longer-term benefits that will accrue by reducing the uh, threats to health in the future. So I think it's about presenting a positive alternative to the current mode of development, which focuses very much with, with human health and sustainability at the center. One thing that people haven't mentioned, I think, is the problem of vested interests. I mean, why do we have so much anti-science propaganda? It's not an accident. It's because there are many people who are making very large amounts of money out of undermining natural systems and about not paying the full economic costs of their activities. So I think we need to face that up front and we need to accept that there will be vested interests and those vested interests really need to be opposed, obviously by strong evidence, but also mobilizing the public uh, and the kind of groups that we've already talked about today uh, in terms of uh, really confronting some of those vested interests to um, really show the weak um, basis on which their denialism is based. And denialism is different from skepticism. Skepticism is, is good, but denialism uh, is, is something that we need to struggle against. So I think it's both positive, but also we need to be realistic about the vested interests that we have to oppose. Thank you so much. Indeed, change is not comfortable, but that's the only way forward. So we're going to transition to the second panel. I see that some of the panelists are already with us. So over to you, Sandrine, to kick off the second part of the dialogue. Thank you so much for all these questions. Thank you so much, Elise. And can I thank again the last panel as well, um, all of you for, first of all, your own commitment, but also your work with us in the Planetary Emergency Partnership. Thank you so much for your thoughtfulness during the first session. And as we move into the, the next session, I'm really pleased to bring in another partner in crime from, from the Potsdam Institute, um, Owen Gaffney, but also someone who's been working a great deal on, on Global Commons through the Global Commons Alliance. We haven't really spoken enough about the complexity of preserving our Global Commons, uh, Many times what has come out is also the need to bring in the Global South, both in terms of citizens, but also leaders in decision making. And so I'm very hopeful that this next panel allows us to do that. 
I'm also very hopeful that we can switch into one of the key questions that came out in our last panel, which was around the need to mobilize capital. We weren't able to properly look at that. And Peter, I'm sure, but also Lucy, through the great work that she's doing with Vivid Economics and trying to see how we can look at natural capital, will be able to enable us through that discussion. There are also a series of other conversations that are happening right now in terms of debt for nature swaps, um, other ways in which we can ensure that we bring money to natural capital, to the global commons, and to those countries that are the most hit by COVID because they don't have a huge amount of maneuverability within their systems to be able to cope from a financial perspective. So I'm gonna let you, Owen, say a few words and then we can move on through the great next panel that we have and hopefully have as vibrant a conversation as we've just had. Okay, th th uh, thanks Sandrine. And it's been um, a really uh, fascinating, interesting journey we've been on for the last uh, 12 months, uh, you know, this time last year, um, launching, the, uh, launching the report. And then, as, as you said, just as a reminder for, uh, for, for others um, who may have joined, you know, we went on this journey from, from launching you know, at Chatham House, um, uh, during London Climate Week to the UN General Assembly, uh, where we had, um, you know, world leaders, including Boris Johnson, 10 other world leaders, um, subscribing to the fact that we are in a planetary emergency. And, and, and of course, then uh, this, this was all before uh, the, the pandemic. This was before uh, the, um, the fires in the Amazon and the fires in Australia. It was um, uh, before the uh, incredible research just um, a couple of months ago showing that uh, for each one degree rise in temperature, one billion people are in serious trouble. Uh, so that makes three billion people in the next few decades if we do not act very rapidly in serious trouble, um, living outside of our climate niche, uh, living with uh, serious issues related to crop production and migration. And this was before we published our ass assessment in Nature on tipping points in the Earth system assessing what happened 10 years ago when tipping points were first identified and 15 tipping points were identified and showing that now uh, you know we can show that nine of those tipping points are active they're undergoing serious serious change so um, and of course before this global pandemic um, which has exposed the vulnerabilities and how fragile our economic and political systems are so um, on, uh, on specifically on this this session here we're going to be talking about the short term um, solutions and opportunities we have I mean this is a transformative moment for humanity how do we make sure this is a green and equitable transformative moment do we rebuild as we say in, in the, the new text do we rebuild our economy with the same inequalities fragilities vulnerabilities and instabilities as before why would anyone accept that um, that level of economic insecurity and long-term survival um, uh, and you know as, as myself and Johan have, have pointed out several times um, over the last uh, year or so that we see that we have reached four tipping points um, on earth bef before the pandemic we have the social movements you know led by Fridays for the future and the young generation this is a phenomenal moment we haven't seen in our lifetime uh, we have the political action the only thing the UK could agree last year was a, a green deal uh, Europe is talking about net zero by 2050. The US is talking about net zero by 2050. We have the digital revolution uh, and we have the economic um, logic now in place for a very rapid transition. So the 2020s could be the most rapid economic transition in history if we get this right in the next six months to 12 months. Thank you, Owen. I, I think you're absolutely right. And thank you for bringing up the tipping points as well, because we're so focused on COVID that we have a tendency to forget that actually there are many other tipping points, even beyond just the climate and the biodiversity tipping points. And, and I'd like to, to come back to, to one of the key tipping points, which again is related to, to the global commons. And it's been a real pleasure for me to meet Princess Esmeralda of Belgium um, and do some, some work with her um, indirectly and that series of conversations that we had, both as your capacity as an environmentalist and an author, but I think most predominantly in this conversation, maybe some of your reflections on what's happening in the Amazon and indigenous peoples who are being very hit by both COVID and clearly the climate and biodiversity tipping points. 
Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Sandrine. And uh, I would like to start uh, saying that the previous conversation was very important, very interesting. And I would like to um, outline three points. The need for intersectionality, it's a difficult word, but we have seen that we cannot address the environmental crisis without talking about the sanitary crisis, also the social one. Everything is linked. We have the refugee uh, crisis, we have poverty to address, we have uh, gender inequality, uh, discrimination, everything is linked and it's important to, to outline that. Second point is awareness. We might have more awareness, but still, um, I was very struck to read um, an article lately saying that among the climate denial countries, number one, that is not a surprise, is USA, but number two is Sweden. And Sweden is the country of Greta Thunberg. So I was really, really surprised to see that. And it means that we still have a lot of work to do in terms of awareness. And my third point is alliance. And as Bernadette said before, we have to talk together. I think we have to build big alliance. And even if we don't agree on all the points, try to find the 98% or 99% of points we agree on and start the conversation and build this alliance. Now to talk about the indigenous people, as you said, uh, Sandrine, they are really at risk for the moment. The COVID-19 is having a devastating effect, especially in the Amazon, whether it's in Peru or Ecuador or Brazil, obviously, uh, because they are vulnerable to disease. And also because there is an incredible push for the moment of the illegal loggers, the miners, the gold diggers, they're all there thinking that the world is not watching, which is the case. And of course, they are vectors of the disease too, but they are bringing this incredible uh, environmental destruction. We know that deforestation is up 51%. That uh, last year where there was those incredible fires, we lost an incredible uh, land surface. And this year seems to be uh, on the same path. So there's, there's really urgency to, to try to help those communities First of all, because they are the best guardians of the biodiversity that we know that the Amazon is essential for all of us because of its role of uh, regulating climate and also for the biodiversity. But also, and, and I think that's the main thing, because those communities are so vulnerable, they have their livelihood from the forest, they have been all through centuries all killed, or displaced, uh, first by uh, the colonial times, now by the multinational uh, uh, companies. So we have to stand in solidarity with them, help them. And also, uh, as for example, the European community, see what is our own impact in terms of consumption of goods, whether it's wood, whether it's meat, whether it's soja, all that is a conversation we have to, to have very soon. Thank you for that. And it, I think it's a very important reminder. And of course, again, we were talking about the need to move from ecosystems to ecosystems. And we see some of the issues in, in the region and in particular in those countries that, that touch the Amazon and uh, that also have indigenous peoples. And this has always been a key issue with regard to the rights of indigenous peoples. We've tried to integrate some of that language. And in particular with Owen and myself, we've been very sensitive as we speak about the global commons to think through around one, the definition of the global commons. And, and I would really like to bring this up as we speak to Minister Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, but also Gonzalo Munoz in terms of the, the COP25 and, and the Chilean discussions and the Spanish discussions around the need to understand what are global commons and do we really have a right to those global commons? And then the other is the plight of those people that are so dependent on those areas that we're seeing are the most vulnerable and also suffering from the destruction. 
So maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, actually, Minister, and um, I'm going to call you Carlos because it's so hard to call you Minister if you don't mind. <laughs> Not at all. Because, because I, I have been so appreciative of, of the work that, that you are doing and, and the incredible relationship that we've been able to have over the last year um, through the Planetary Emergency Partnership, but also through the <coughs> Emergency Plan. Um, and, and the high ambition coalition that, that you are leading and, and all of your work to ensure that there is ambition both in terms of climate, nature and people. So Carlos, what is some of your thinking in terms of, you know, how we, have we hit the tone right in terms of the plan? Have we brought in the right elements and how can we really build on this? Well, thank you, Sandrine, and, and uh, good morning from Costa Rica to all of you. It's a um, great pleasure to be here participating. I, I definitely believe, Sandrine, that yes, we have hit all <clears throat> the different sweet spots that we need to be able to address. Nevertheless, there are two things that I strongly believe that we need to concentrate and focus ourselves. One, <clears throat> nature provides us with half of the global GDP. <clears throat> And, and even though we invest 0.006% of global GDP in our effort to be on the 1.5 uh, pathway and, our, and in our effort to protect, uh, protect our global biodiversity. So we are far from where we should be doing in terms of mobilizing resources. In terms of uh, climate investment and resource mobilization, we are basically 40% 40% of what we should be mobilizing as of today to be in track with the 1.5 and in terms of protecting global biodiversity and avoiding the biodiversity collapse we are just investing 20% of the resources that today we should be investing to revert the high red uh, rate of biodiversity loss so <clears throat> this is a very concrete fact we humans cannot thrive in a uh, the, in, in a sick planet. So we need to be able to really understand how do we mobilize resources from all sources, and this is not just resources from the north to the south. We can triple and do a high effort to increase the flow of resources through ODA that that will never ever do any change at the level and scale that we want it. It won't be until countries, all countries, realize that it's in their own self-interest to mobilize more effectively, particularly domestic resources, uh, uh, that we will be on track to be able to mobilize resources at the level that we need it. And I think that it's not just also, it's not just mobilizing the resources, but facing out, most importantly, facing out all of those perverse incentive subsidies and direct um, and uh, and direct uh, public investment. Just to give you an example, Sandrine, today the planet invests 140 times, 42 times more money in uh, activities that generate uh, tropical deforestation than what we invest in forest conservation. We invest uh, 500 billion dollars in activities that generates uh, biodiversity loss when we are basically investing around. $82 billion in protecting nature globally. So it's not just a matter of being able to mobilize more resources, more strategically from all sources, avoiding the north-south confrontation on who is, on where is the money for the 1.5, where is the money for protecting nature, and realizing that it is in our own self-interest to really mobilize and face out perverse incentives, perverse policy. That's on, on one side. My second point here, and, and this is extremely important for me, is the fact that we need to overcome the, the fact that we won't be able to do the leap forward in terms of our sustainability aspiration with the same institutional framework that in first place created the problem that we want to solve. How we governments have organized uh, ourselves to deal with, the, with social development, uh, economic growth, and nature conservation. And Costa Rica has a couple of good experience. You, you see me as the Minister of Environment of Costa Rica, but at the same time, I'm the Minister of Energy, Mines, Water, and the Ocean. I don't have a Minister of Energy to fight with in terms of the short, long-term issues, development issues at all. 
So we in Costa Rica, we don't divide the institutional structure in the management of natural resources in the classical way, which is on one side, you got agencies managing non-renewable natural resources, and on the other side, you got uh, agencies managing renewable natural resources. This is kind of the best element for the institutional conflict, what I call the institutional failure. We need to really began doing transformation on how we organize ourselves, governments, in a way that works um, para, um, consistently with the sustainability as aspirations. I've been having a lot of calls with ministers of environment from Latin America and ministers from energy. And let me tell you, both groups are thinking very different how to address the aftermath of COVID-19. Many ministers of energy and mines want more oil and gas and large scale mining in indigenous territories in protected areas because they feel that this is a quick win. And you know, in, in this social health crisis, women are looking for short magical wins. Yeah. And, and that is something very concrete that we need to address. My final, final point here, Sandrine, there are very interesting things happening. And again, I will share you an experience that happened last Friday. IMF is beginning conversations with Costa Rica on how they can support us deal with the economic recession. And for the first time, I was invited as Minister of Environment and Energy to an IMF meeting where the IMF spent two hours talking about our decarbonization plan and how the IMF economic relief program will accelerate the decarbonization plan in Costa Rica. This is wonderful never happened before. And this took me to the fact that uh, we need to address the economic stimulus plan in a more holistic way where we can really accelerate the implementation of our climate and nature commitments. Thank you. Fully agree. And thank you so much, Carlos, for ending on that note, because I think as we move towards Gonzalo, who is also a champion, <coughs> for COP26 um, and obviously 25. And if we look at the green recovery conversations that we've been promoting, working with yourself and others across the Planetary Emergency Partnership, we right now must make sure that as we move through the recovery, it is both green and social. It cannot be about business as usual. So Gonzalo, it's such a pleasure to have you here. And I really thank both you and Carlos who got up very early to be with us this morning. Um, it shows your dedication. As a high-level climate action champion, what is your thinking about, one, what we're proposing, but secondly, how things have slightly shifted um, over the last few years to be much more this understanding of the convergence of tipping points rather than just focusing on a siloed approach with regard to either climate or biodiversity or now our discussions on health? Well, thank you so much, Sandine, and thank you for the cover from for, for setting this amazing and fundamental conversation. Uh, let me first react to, to what we have just heard uh, and, and, and what the, the previous panelists uh, shared with us. Uh, so, so somehow based on that human dimension that was very well described previously, I believe it's so much about hard learnings. Uh, for me and, and probably for most of you as well, so many things that are happening seems to be quite obvious, quite an obvious consequence of the way humans have been evolving in time, how we have uh, considered science, how we have managed the risk, how we have been trading nature, not giving the right value to ecosystemical services, understanding nature uh, as mainly resources instead of human assets, diminishing diversity, and in that sense, even touching to what uh, Her Royal Highness mentioned, not only diversity in terms of the natural diversity, but also the diversity that we require among ourselves. So those learnings, uh, this new dimension of risk, this new dimension for science, for empathy, for relationships, for care, are from my perspective, basic elements of what is emerging. I love this phrase that uh, Augustus mentioned very brilliantly and, and he explained how emergencies related to some things that are emerging. I think that this emerging moment seems like a birth. Uh, and, 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 and this birth is, is bringing a lot of pain as well, we know that, but I'm much more connected to what is, uh, is, 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 is 
uh, coming as a birth and much more than what is um, hopefully dying. And, uh, and, and that is also a new area of awareness, like Her Royal Highness also expressed. We must, of course, in that new area of awareness, support integrating nature-based solutions in climate action plans and any other development tools like the recovery plans uh, that many countries are working on. I'm absolutely connected to what my friend Carlos Manuel mentioned in terms of that's a concern. We need that to be embedded into the plans. Um, we know that healthy ecosystems are the cornerstone of nature-based solutions and, and they underpin the sustainable development goals. This is a, a critical decade for a, achieving the sustainable development goals and they support economic growth, uh, sustain billions of livelihoods, provide the basic food and water security, stabilize our climate. We have so many reports showing the great consequence of biodiversity loss to climate change to our economy and to our own survival, being the pandemic probably one of those. Uh, COVID-19 definitely punctuates these findings by showing us the dangerous cost of nature loss to people, health, well-being, and to the economy. I really believe that's even stupid that we haven't realized how much we need a healthy environment for developing all of our activities. How is it possible that we have that we still have all those per perverse incentives that Carlos Manuel properly explained? When when we have so much evidence of how much that is harming all of us. It's, it's a matter of really realizing if we are an intelligent species. Um, so, so now in this key moment, it's fundamental to unlock the potential of nature-based solutions and allow them to deliver that 30% of the solution by 2030 and also deliver much needed resilience to, uh, to withstand uh, the impacts of climate change. Regarding the, the, the non-party stakeholders, that is the role of, of, of the high-level champions uh, to be mobilizing and activating. There's so much to do and it's being done. Um, we, we have seen cities must be planning connection to nature, including its capacity to grow food while cleaning air and water. Part of the failure we have seen regarding the lack of resilience during the pandemic is related to bad planning, socially and envir environmentally. We know how to do better. We need more integrated approaches, as you mentioned, Ms. Sandrine. Mm -hmm. And it's not just time for traditional and absolutely extremely required natural conservation. Today is time for regeneration. And, and, and with my dear friend, Nigel Topping, the high level climate action champion for COP26 uh, from the UK, we as climate champions are working on a very strong agenda around nature-based solutions, including of course, regenerative agriculture, like One Planet uh, Business for Biodiversity, where even most of those businesses that are participating there are also members of the Climate Ambition Alliance committed to net zeros in the 40s and now being part of Race to Zero, uh, this massive campaign that we launched three weeks ago that is including everybody that is willing to participate in our race to become a zero as, as early as possible. Gonzalo, thank you so much for, I think also pinpointing some of the key issues that seem so obvious and yet people are not picking up. And the fact that yourself as a champion and Nigel and all the other champions who are working on trying to bring all this together into the net zero dialogues, but also make sure that COP26, even if postponed, we create that momentum. And I think that's why I'm gonna let Owen take over because Owen and myself are very much working in this momentum space, along with Johan and Elise and all the others in the Planetary Emergency Partnership to try to ensure that there is no dead silence even though we don't have the international negotiations when we think we will, as we're living now in this COVID world. Owen. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sandrine. And yeah, so, and our next uh, speaker, I mean, follows on very, very nicely from, uh, from Gonzalo, uh, you know, as Gonzalo points out, you know, uh, how can we uh, not uh, understand our um, the, the importance of nature and the interconnectedness of um, uh, of the, the 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 nature challenges with climate and uh, health challenges, and uh, and this narrative has been changing over the last uh, few years. Um, the connection between nature has uh, and climate. Um, has become um, a greater. It's more under. It's, that narrative is getting more embedded in the in the public thinking and policy thinking, and a lot of that is to do with uh, nature for climate. Lucy Elman, the CEO of Nature for Climate, and I am just 
blown away they uh, by what they have done in the last few years to um, to make that connection uh, we, we talk about it um, uh, uh, theoretically and uh, as an advocacy this is what we need to do they're on the ground uh, doing it and succeeding uh, Lucy over to you Thank you very much, Owen, and thanks to the Club of Rome for inviting us to be part of this today. It's been a real honour to be part of the Planetary Emergency Partnership. Um, and yes, as Owen mentioned, I've been leading the Nature for Climate Coalition for the last three and a half years. And uh, we are a collective of 16 large organisations. So I think, Owen, it answers the point that came up earlier on about the need for this to be collective action. I think the power of what we've done is because we are a large group who have come together, united behind one goal, which was really to put nature on the map alongside decarbonisation as a climate solution and to mobilise the political and corporate action needed to make that a reality. Um, and I remember back in, so in 2018, at the Global Climate Action Summit in California, that felt like a Herculean task. Um, our creative strapline at the time was nature was the forgotten solution. But since then, I think progress, um, there's been real progress, as you've mentioned. Last year alone, there were 100 science papers on the topic of natural climate solutions. And the momentum at last year's UN Climate Action Summit was powerful from governments, from private sector, civil society, and with the help of Greta Thunberg, uh, the nature and climate message even cut through to a whole new generation and audience. Um, but the amount of climate finance going into this area is still a fraction of what it should be, it's less than 4%, and the number of nationally determined contributions or NDCs with quantifiable targets for nature-based solutions is still minimal. Um, so the opportunities I see, the short-term opportunities in the next 12 to 18 months are really twofold. First is to continue with our Nature for Climate campaign goal, which is around increasing and enhancing the number of NDCs using nature-based solutions. And we should also, particularly at the moment, not lose sight of the fact that um, NDCs can play a vital role in economic recovery efforts. They can be you know, one of the best vehicles, actually, for governments to articulate the vision of economic growth. And a good example of that is Chile, which in April, I think, announced its updated climate pledge, um, the core of which is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. But it makes very clear reference in there to the role that nature can play coastal ecosystems and forests. And not only will this help Chile meet its carbon neutrality goal, but also provide jobs, tourism, forest related sectors, and all the revenue that comes with that. Um, which really brings me to my second point, um, which is the need to build out this complementary narrative around the role of na nature, not, not just for its climate stabilizing role, but for its economic contribution. And right now, recovery conversations have clearly been about, rightly, about health and the short-term economic impacts of the COVID-19 crisis. But we felt that we've been missing the direct link between nature-based solutions and the type of evidence that resonates with policy make makers, um, particularly those in finance ministries, those kind of return on investment numbers. And so the report that Nature for Climate is putting out today is a first step to try to fill that communications gap. And it makes the case for nature-based solutions in economic terms. Um, and I'm really hopeful because I see much more research emerging in this area. Um, as Sandrine mentioned, Vivid Economics is doing some fantastic work analyzing the green stimulus packages as they're coming out. Last week, the Campaign for Nature released a report on this topic. The World Economic Forum releases its second New Nature Economy report in July, and the UK government's Das Gupta review is coming out. So this is all great. We need this research, but we also need the mobilization strategies behind that. So we need to also fund the campaigns that can help take that message to a much broader audience. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Lucy. And it's it's really good to hear that some of the uh, the new NDCs as they're coming out uh, focus more on um, 
on nature-based solutions. This was completely absent in the, the, the first tranche of, um, of NDCs. So this is d definitely a positive step. And I mean, all the, this advocacy work, this, 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 this research, um, is, um, all of it is having some sort of impact quite rapidly. Um, so our next uh, speaker is, um, is Peter Blum from um, the CEO of uh, Tridos Bank. And, uh, and Peter is, uh, you know, Tridos Bank um, is uh, is extremely progressive bank. Um, it's uh, doing a lot of work uh, in this space um, uh, around, you know, climate action, around regenerative um, agriculture, around nature-based solutions as, as well, for sure. Um, but Peter, over to you. What are the, um, uh, how, how do we get action? What are the immediate priorities? And, uh, and how do we start moving capital uh, in, in the right direction? Yes, I'm very happy to uh, participate in this meeting and uh, also being a proud member of the Club of Rome uh, and be part of that, uh, I would say, a uh, new phase of the Club of Rome as well, being very active in, in what is going on at the moment. It's our moment, I would say, and I really appreciate to be part of that. I think uh, if you look at the economy and the finance sector, you could see that uh, companies in the real economy more or less took the whole environmental climate challenge much earlier than the financial sector. The financial sector always followed the, the, real, uh, the real economy. And uh, I hope that will change because we started to realize probably in the beginning of this century and after the uh, financial uh, crisis that a lot of decisions of the real economy leaders were guided by the short-term interest of the people who financed them. And if you not go behind what companies, uh, uh, what is guiding companies, you really do not make a lot of change. So it was very important for me personally, but also for uh, the progressive banks. I'm, I'm, I'm part of that movement uh, to make clear that the function of banks and finance investment funds is much bigger than we maybe see. Uh, that has changed. I think the whole uh, topic of sustainable finance is on the on the Commission's agenda, it's worldwide on the agenda. This the UN Principles for Responsible Banking was really a step in that direction. We have also been helping there to formulate those steps. And I think what you could see now in the financial sector from ignoring uh, climate questions to use it as a marketing PR tool, it's still happening, I must say, so a lot of greenwashing going on, to look at the risks involved, um, I think, banks started to recognize there are really risk with the climate also for them. The central bank started to do that, what has been a very important factor that this organization of greening the uh, central bank regulation, I think is very important. Then I think we move really to the opportunities part, renewable energy, solar has been very important. But now we come in a very interesting place. I think it's not anymore about what banks doing a little bit of nice green and make good uh, good stories about it, but that they reduce actually their unsustainable activities. Uh, the whole discussion is around brown assets has come very much up and now step by step start to land also with the regulators who can really see that banks with huge assets, brown assets are really at risk. That can really be a help to get a transition going and it should be much more visible and much more in the in the regulation as an important uh, element of greening the financial sector. And I think the other part, uh, part is uh, that banks are now much more committing themselves to the uh, to a green growth path. I think what has been very important, we started a green commitment to Paris uh, goals in the Netherlands. We managed also to do it in Spain. And just two days ago, it happened in Germany. So the financial sector has committed itself to the steps up to 2030. And why is that so important? Because if we do not agree on milestones and measure those milestones, it will continue to be nice stories, but nothing happens. And if there is a real path for financial institutions based on scientific uh, input and say, well, this is what you have to do next year, and then the next year, the next year, and in 2030, you have to reduce your assets the incorporated sort of uh, CO2 in your assets, uh, the carbon in your assets has to be reduced as 50%, then it doesn't happen. We also developed uh, PCAF, what is the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials. It's a methodology where you can actually measure 
carbon in the balance sheet of banks. And I think it's a very important tool to uh, come down from the nice stories to the actual paths of change. Where do I see really a, a role for the financial sector between governments and the role of the citizens? On the one side, I think we should really in, make much more people aware of that they can make a difference, they can make a choice. In Europe, that's happening, but it could happen much more worldwide. Banks are really, uh, well, they, they, they are sensitive to what their customers are saying to them. On the other hand, and that has been uh, not such a good story, but that comes now much better, is the governments, and particularly the Green Deal in Europe, I think is a very positive step what gives the context for the financial sector of long-term investments, because it has been too much short-termism. And only with long-termism, we can make the, the right investments as the financial sector. That has now started to be addressed by the government. Nobody else can do that, only government can do that. And Corona made that even stronger. The cooperation between the governments and the financial sector have been very positive, I think, in most European countries, helped really entrepreneurs uh, through the first months, hopefully more. And we should use that mechanism also for the long-term uh, uh, climate uh, investment we have to take. So I see a new area, area of uh, combination of uh, governments with financial sectors and really push the financial sector in that direction. The main areas are, of course, the circular economy, renewable finance, but also a very important one is agri and food. It's one of the most uh, difficult ones, I think, to tackle. There's not a, a lot of money and profit there. Uh, it has to change. I'm very happy that the European Commission said 25% of uh, agriculture has to become sustainable. It's a huge contributor to uh, carbon. So that is one of the core issues banks should take, uh, take up. So I think uh, with this document now, and the emphasis on agriculture and food and the role of finance in that, I think we're really making progress and making step forward. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Peter. Um, and um, I, I'll just on your last point, uh, uh, only 25% of agriculture. I wonder why it isn't uh, <laughs> more, but, um, but in the interest of time, I want to pass over to um, Elise, who, um, who will chair the, uh, the question and answer sessions. Uh, but thank you to, to all the panelists for your um, uh, fantastic um, interventions. Elise, over to you. Yes, I have a question for you, Carlos. Carlos Manuel Rodriguez, Minister of Environment for Costa Rica, from Jacques de Gerlache, who wrote a paper on the system of the EU Green Deal. So Carlos, uh, we have so many good leaders in Costa Rica. How do you build capacities for other leaders in your country, but also in other countries to address these very complex issues? As you said, we can't use the same old institutions, values and indicators if we want to have a systemic transformation and it's not a linear process. So how do we go beyond the GDP growth and how do we uh, build capacities for other leaders to, to implement this systemic transformation? Thank you, Elisa, for this, and this is a great question. I feel um, very happy to see a groundswell civil society movement happening in Costa Rica, particularly by the young generation that is pushing hard for a transition and a transformation, uh, not just from for the uh, public sector, but most importantly, the economic sector. And, and and this is uh, becoming very, very strong, particularly nowadays that many decisions are being taken in Congress. Costa Rica is expecting Congress to step in very strongly and give us, you know, bold, uh, strong decisions. Nevertheless, there are a lot of economic sector and conservative political groups which are thinking on, you know, going back to the old normality, meaning that even though Costa Rica has a moratorium on oil and gas for the last 20 years, opening oil and gas in Costa Rica is a option for some congressmen. So I think that, uh, that uh, the transition towards a new generation of young kids that has felt that their future has been compromised by my generation is gonna make the change. But four things, here, these are extremely important and, and uh, to, to, to say. 
uh, we need governments to continue to raise a level of ambition and allocate resources to be able to implement, a, implement their uh, Paris uh, commitment. We need uh, to have public and private actors uh, coordinate to scale up finance in sectors that boast beyond renewable energies. And I want to highlight what uh, Lucy was mentioning uh, uh, to us. 80% uh, of the global climate finance is being invested in transportation energy in industrialized countries. And very little is being mobilized uh, to nature solution, being nature solution one of the most cost-effective sectors to give us uh, positive climate outcomes. The other thing is that all financial sectors should seek full alignment of, of, um, of the Paris Agreement in all of their operations. And, and here, uh, building on Peter, I think that capital markets and banks must, must shift towards green finance very soon, very quickly. And for all of this, we need congressional decisions and strong leadership in the executive branch. Thank you so much. We count on you on the green finance agenda. There's another question from uh, Decima Williams, who's uh, raising the point in terms of the vulnerability of small island states. Um, and uh, indeed a lot of islands that are at the forefront of climate impacts and in particular due to sea level rise. So maybe the need for, this is the need for collective action and shared leadership as a source of hope and global optimism. So I would like to ask you, Owen, as you have also been one of the key architects behind the Planetary Emergency Partnership, I believe this is really the spirit of our global platform to develop this spirit of shared leadership and collective action. And you're also working on the Global Commons Alliance. So can you tell us more about this? Okay, um, yeah, thanks, Elise. So, I, I mean, yeah, on some of the best, most impressive, important leadership in this area has come from uh, small island states. I mean, this um, emergence of the High Ambition Coalition um, during the, uh, in the, the before um, the, the Paris COP and uh, the Paris Agreement was absolutely fundamental to getting 1.5 degrees um, as a as a target, not just two degrees um, in that in that. And this this coalition has been phenomenal from you know uh, linking wealthy countries in Europe and elsewhere uh, with uh, you know um, poorer um, smaller um, uh, island communities and other vulnerable com um, communities. And now we're seeing that with nature too and. And uh, again, with uh, leadership from Costa Rica it's, uh, and, and, and Carlos, this um, high ambition coalition coming together around, around nature, which is, is just absolutely critical. I mean, uh, to your general point, um, you know, with the Global Commons Alliance, uh, we met last week, 200 uh, people, 60 organizations uh, to create, um, to, 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 to work out, well, what, what are the conditions needed? We're not getting enough leadership from um, politicians. Um, how, do, how can we build a greater alliance among cities and businesses um, and, uh, and citizens to create the collective action? And you know, what do we need for that? We need to set targets. Uh, so the Global Commons Alliance um, will create science-based targets, not just for climate, but across um, um, all of nature, all the critical global commons. Um, we need to build trust among, among these groups. And, and we need a common understanding, a shared understanding of the state of the system. And uh, the Global Commons Alliance is designed to do those, um, those three things. Um, so this is, uh, you know, watch this space. There'll be interim targets launched later this year and, uh, and some ma major media initiatives launched in the next couple of months on this. Thank you so much, Owen. So there's one last question from Hunter Lovins, who's the president of the Natural Capitalism Solutions. And this is a question for all the panelists. So if you could answer the question in one minute, one minute each, what would be your recommendation in terms of a very concrete action that all individuals can take? So something that all of us can do today, uh, all the participants, the 124 participants, and maybe broadening the question a little bit, if you could also talk about a specific area of collaboration between non-state actors and governments, uh, something specific that can really make a difference. So let's start with Peter. I think what everybody can do, and you can imagine that that's my uh, area of expertise. Everybody can look at his own portfolio, at the way he or she is not only spending his or her money, and does that really trigger a more sustainable economy? 
but go a little bit further and say, what is happening with my savings? What's happening with my, my investments? I think the power of uh, the finance consumer, the citizen, is, is huge and, and will really make a difference. That is what everybody can do. We are all bankers in the end, and it's not just the bankers who are bankers. So that's one thing. I think the cooperation with government, I feel that the, the, the long-term uh, dimension of the transition of the economy plus the the spirit of the private sector and the banks who can act there, there should be much more cooperation there. So I think there is a, a providing context is something what governments to do within that context. I think the private sector can much more act and banks can help them with acting. And that uh, synchronicity there or this cooperation there has been lacking and now is improving, but we can much more do there. I'm, I'm quite convinced. And Corona, as I said, was a good example there. Uh, we can do it if there is urgency. Excellent. Lucy. Great, thanks. Um, well, as, a, as the panel's communications kind of expert, I guess I would say this, but my view is that every individual can join a mobilizing movement of some kind. And it is in that collective power that you can really, really make change. Um, I read a great article this week by Tom Brooks of the European Climate Foundation. So I advise you all to read it. Um, he's an excellent campaigner, but the one quote that stood out for me was, um, meaningful policy change almost always happens through collective effort, not by the individual heroics of any one organization. And so my view is as an individuals join together, there are many, many mobilization strategies that you can be part of. Um, and then in terms of the non-state actor and government collaboration, I, the thing that, that I'm most excited about this year is actually Project Countdown. So the countdown event, which is targeted specifically at non-state actors, I think is a great uh, initiative that we could all join forces with and, and look at the energy that's going on within the non-state actor uh, sectors Thank at the you. moment. Gonzalo. Um, well, uh, connected to, to what Owen said, at the initial part of this panel, it's not only about what we can do, it's how important it is to do it in the next six months. Everything, I mean, every extra effort that we do regarding our four powers, I would say, the first power being voting, right? And, and some people in the world will have a possibility of impacting positively in the next six months due, due to their capacity of voting. Another one is related to our financial capacity that Peter explained. Uh, not only through our in investment, but also our purchase power. And, and in that sense, connecting to all those companies that are already committed to net zero by, by the, the 40s, it's important to, for them to receive the support of the, of, of the community. Uh, the third power is talent. Uh, each of us have a possibility, on whether because it's, it's finding a new job or in their current job has a capacity of putting this topic into the agenda of the company very proactively. As Lucy say, you can even create a movement uh, in your organization. Uh, and the fourth one is love. And that's very well expressed as well in the, in, the, in the youth movement in the streets, but every kind of relationship in which we are involved, we can use that moment to also impact more rapidly in terms of what the changes are required in the next six months. So use those four powers very wisely and with much more strength in the next six months. Thank you so much. Princess Esmeralda, top recommendation. Uh, I agree totally with Lucy. We need a big, big movement. We need citizens all over the world to really mobilize for that. Uh, a big alliance, as I said before. Uh, the power is with the people. The problem is that uh, we have been convinced that we don't have this power and we have it. We have to push our governments, we have to push our companies and, and corporation and we can do it. Uh, it has been proven that if we get to those crucial 3%, we can really have an impact. So we need this enormous mobilization. And of course, uh, for those who have a uh, uh, some uh, things in the banks uh, push for uh, divest and uh, uh, leave all the fossil fuels action they have and move to renewable that of course thank you i don't see carlos anymore so owen over to you i think carlos had to leave actually
Elise. I've been told that the, the next incredible group of speakers for our next session with Global Optimism have joined us, and I'd like to welcome them all. But I'm going to just maybe conclude, Elise, unless, unless we've forgotten anyone else for their last... All good. Over to you. Okay. So first of all, can, can I thank all of the speakers, all of those also who are members of the Planetary Emergency Partnership and, and the core members that we've been working together with over the last year. You, you have all brought up the most essential aspects of how we can really turn the ship around and build the resilience that we need in order to emerge from emergency. I would urge all of you who are still on and following us to please go on to the link or go on to the website. This is now for public consultation. This is our version of the Planetary Emergency Plan 2.0. What we want to do is launch the final version and bring as many people on board as possible as we move into the unfortunate Earth Overshoot Day on the 22nd of August, something which one of our members of the Club of Rome, Matisse Wagenackel, has been very dedicated to and started quite a while back. As we close, I also want to very much echo the need to build this movement with all the possible leaders across all different sectors, across all different disciplines, as well as citizens and the intergenerational dialogue that we need to build from that. What I often say in the Club of Rome is that as we are in this emergency, let's make sure that the short-term interventions are already creating the systems change that we need to see to build that future that we want. So as we focus on now, and some of you have talked about not only the decade of action, but the urgency of the next six months, let's all make sure that as many countries as possible put in place the green and social recovery plans that we need, that they don't go back to business as usual and propping up the old economy, that we communicate properly to people that actually what is essential post COVID is those values that we have just focused on, hope, love, health, and all of the different roles and responsibilities, whether it be through ensuring food security, water security, access to energy, all of those different basic needs that we all have. If we can do that in the next six months, building up to COP26, building up to COP15, building up to countdown, ensuring that we bring everyone together around the G20, taking all those key intervention moments and making a difference, as we influence governments and people on the ground, then we probably will be able to reach this decade of action that we've been calling for and have the outcomes that we need so that we can emerge from emergency. So I look forward to continuing to working with all of you. You are all definitely welcome to join us as members of and partners of the Planetary Emergency Partnership. And I look forward to continuing the afternoon with all of our incredible partners to bring all of these messages to bear and to look at the solutions as we move forward. Thank you very much for joining us for this first two hours of our planetary emergency, emergence from emergency session and have a good rest of the day. <laughs>